Hello, Pure Heart family. So glad you could join us online today. Hey, if you're part of our online experience on Facebook, go ahead, click a like, share this video with a friend, or share it to your own Facebook page. If you're on YouTube, go ahead, hit that subscribe button, and we are rolling to week three of our series called Out of Control. Make sure you go back and check out week one and week two if you miss them. I've heard so many people share that ever since the series started, how God is using it in their lives. So here we go, we're gonna take this time together to refocus, encourage our hearts, cast out fear and lies from our minds. Let's lean in, grab our Bibles and open our Bible apps. Let's worship together, let's grow together, get healthier together and become more like Jesus for the sake of others. Welcome to church. Welcome, welcome. Would you stand up and worship with us wherever you're at? Let's sing this together when all I see is the battle. I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds. There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe with you. So when I fight on, fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night.
we know that the battle belongs to you. Continue to be with us as we worship. I count on one thing. It's the same God that never fails, will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. It's the same God who's never late, is working all things out. Working all things out
give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do.
God, we look to you. You're where our help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. Amen, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us for worship, wherever you're at. And uh, Holy Spirit is here. Amen. Well, every week we pray for another pastor in the valley. And this week we're praying for Pastor Juan Ramos at Love International Ministries. Love International Ministries has an incredible ministry of prayer. One of the biggest prayer ministries actually in the valley. Um, and a great partnership with our prayer ministry here at Pure Heart. And uh, Dan, Pastor Dan, has had a huge uh, relationship with uh, Juan. And they've worked together in unity together across the city. So let's just lift up Juan and International Ministries. Father God, we just thank you for Pastor Juan. We thank you for Love Ministries. Ministries International. We thank you for the mission that you've given them, God. We pray that you would bless them and you would give them favor in the mission that you've called them to. In Jesus' name, amen. Pure Heart family, so glad you could join us today online. This year, we are loving our neighbors and our community for Thanksgiving. We are encouraging you to do one of three things this time. You can bring a food box to church and we will get it to a family in need. The list of what to include in that box can be found on pureheart.org. Scroll on down to the banner that says Thanksgiving. Another option is you could also invite someone to your Thanksgiving table that would have been isolated or alone in this season. And there's so many. Or finally, join with our LifeBridge at Pure Heart team in strategic outdoor locations for small neighborhood dinner gatherings. This opportunity allows you to connect with and love our neighbors. So you can sign up to join a neighborhood team, email angel a george at pureheart.org and say, I wanna be part of a neighborhood dinner. If you live outside the Phoenix metro area, either donate to your local food bank or get in touch with us so we can walk you through setting up a neighborhood dinnerhood where you live. Pure Heart family, let's love our local communities well in this holiday season as so many people have had such a challenging year. And also, let's just thank God for the amazing things that He's doing, allowing us to have so many opportunities to continue to be the hands and feet of Christ as we continue to remember that the church is not a building. Welcome to Pure Heart. We're so glad that you joined us today. You have just dropped into a church that not only sees with Jesus' eyes, but has a heart to make a difference. We don't just wanna love people, we wanna see people's lives absolutely changed for the better. This is a church where we say it is okay to not be okay. You do not have to pretend and you don't have to stay stuck. This is a place where you can be honest and you can be real because we have real issues in this world, but we have a real God who cares about those issues and can transform those difficult things in our life and bring good out of bad situations. Thank you for being here with us today. We're so excited to get to know who you are and we want you to get to know who we are. God bless you. We want to welcome all of you who are watching online this weekend. We're so glad that you joined us. We want to send a great big shout out to Crossroads Recovery. We love you guys and we are so honored to be a part of what God is doing in your life. Also, we want to welcome our Peoria campus. We're truly honored to be with you this weekend. Well, this is the final installment of this three-week series that we have simply titled Out of Control. And really what we've discovered throughout this series is that all of us really want four things. We want control, clarity, security, and certainty. But maybe if you're like me, you're learning some things along the way. And here's what I've discovered throughout this series, something that I'm learning, is that when I try to live in control, I actually have a greater propensity to have a life that is out of control. Sounds ironic, doesn't it? 
Because here's what we know. We know that when we try to live in control, where we try to manipulate outcomes, we try to move things in the direction all the time, the way that we want it to go, we find that living in control clouds our clarity. It shakes our security because life is this constant rhythm of ups and downs. And there are so many things that happen in life that quite frankly, we cannot control. In fact, what we saw last week was that life is for certain, uncertain. And really the only chance that we have for real clarity and real security is when we are willing to relinquish control and put our trust in the one who is certain and his name is Jesus. What we learned is that trust is about a who and not a what. It's about who's driving our life, who is leading our life, who is in charge of our life. And what I want to do this week is I want to take this, this idea in this last part of the series about trust being a who and not a what, and I want to push us just a little bit further in this idea. And here's the big picture for this week. Trusting in Jesus is not a one-time experience. It is a way of life. In fact, I talk to so many people that they come to church they watch online, they raise their hand, they respond, they say yes to Jesus, they click the button online that says, yes, today I put my trust in Jesus. And make no mistake, that is by far the greatest decision that anyone can ever make in their life. But most of the time, people wanna know, okay, now that I've said yes to Jesus, what's next? Well, I would submit to you that what we need to do and the mindset that we need to have, especially in the context of this series, is that we have to move from simply making a decision for Jesus to actually following Jesus, getting to the point where Jesus becomes our life, where his ways become our ways. And over time, as we drive with him, so to speak, and we're sitting in the passenger seat and he's driving the car, we start to become more and more like him in our thoughts and in our actions. Back in 2017, my middle son, Chad, got married in Port Angeles, Washington, which is up north of Seattle. And we decided to make that adventure into a big family road trip. And so on our way back from the beautiful state of Washington, we decided to drive down the Oregon coast, which is, is absolutely breathtaking. Up until then, I had, I've seen the California coast many times, but I'd never seen the Oregon coast. And it was absolutely breathtaking to, to view the beautiful scenery there on the Oregon coast. And we kept driving uh, south down the Oregon coast and we stopped off. This was one of the highlights of that journey. We stopped off at the Tillamook Cheese factory and had some ice cream. I know it sounds funny having ice cream at a cheese factory, but we all know that they make ice cream as well as cheese. And it was some of the best ice cream that we've ever had in our lives. We kept going south on this journey down the coastal highway and we stopped in to see the giant redwood trees of California. And these trees are absolutely majestic and, and to stand there in, in front of one of these trees, like this picture that you see of myself and my daughter, it's just, it's awe-inspiring to look at the, at the majesty of these incredible trees and enjoying God's creation. And why am I sharing all this with you? Because this entire journey that we took together as a family, it covered about 3,600 miles. And it was windy, and in some places it was a bit treacherous. But we were able to navigate this 3,600-mile journey and we were able to do it without a crash, although we had a few close calls. In fact, when we were driving down the avenue of the Giants where all the redwoods are, there was one point, and my wife was in the passenger seat, and I was driving, and she kept saying, look out, look out, and I didn't realize from my vantage point how close that we actually were to some of the roots of these beautiful trees that had spread out over time. And from what my wife told me later, in some spots, we were actually just inches away from having a branch of a tree or a root of one of these great trees take us out. You see, any road trip that we take in life, any journey that we take in life has hazards along the way. And one thing I, I think often in any road trip, especially the one that I just described to you, is that oftentimes we are literally inches away from a crash. We're inches away 
from death. And so I started thinking about that, relating it to our lives and sometimes how hazardous this journey called life can be. There are a lot of people that live on the edge financially and they find themselves just one missed paycheck away from ruin. Some people are living on the edge relationally. They're mixed up with the wrong crowd. And whether they realize it or not, the company that they're keeping is inching them closer and closer toward a cliff. Some people live on the edge relationally because there's an unresolved tension that exists that's moving that relationship toward a disaster. Some marriages are close to a crash, and without some some careful navigation and some fast course correction, there's going to be a crash. Some people are headed for a crash in their business life. Some people are headed for a crash educationally. Some people are headed for a crash because of life-controlling habits or addictions that plague their life. Some are headed for a crash in parenting because of their children going off the rails. You name it, any journey that we take has the potential for a crash, especially in light of our series when we insist on being in control. What I found out is that when people are edging towards a crash like this, whatever the context might be, here's here's their tendency. Their tendency is to say things like, you know what, I'm headed for a crash. I need to get into church. I need to get back around something that can bring me some hope into my situation, or maybe somebody who's been walking with Jesus for a long period of time, if they find themselves a little bit going off the rails in their life and needing some extra pickup because they feel like they're heading for a crash, they'll see things like, you know what, I just need to have another encounter with God. Now, there's nothing wrong with either of those two things of, hey, I'm gonna get back in church or I need another encounter with God, but here's what I know that in my 28 plus years of pastoring people, one of the things that I've seen repeatedly over and over again that makes me scratch my head is people who have made the initial decision to follow Jesus, or they've had multiple, what I would call God encounters, experiencing his presence and his power in their life, and yet there's still a propensity to live life on the edge. There's still a disconnect that exists in their life between what is experienced in church and how it translates into real life. You see, church in and of itself is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's a God idea, but it's not an end all. And what I want you to see in this message this weekend is can I avoid this disconnect and ultimately avoid the crash? Because I am convinced that the more out of control I am, the more clarity security, and certainty I actually have. Why is that? Because the more I trust Jesus with every detail of my life, the more likely I am to avoid life's great crashes. Because trusting in Jesus is not just a one-time experience, but it is a way of life. Now, I can explain it but nobody can explain it like Jesus can. So I wanna look at a a couple of passages, one out of the Gospel of Matthew, and then we're gonna go into the book of James. And I wanna show you this idea that Jesus presents about how we can avoid the great crashes of life by trusting him with every detail of our life, by moving to a place where trusting in Jesus is not just for us a one-time experience, but it becomes a way of life. So in Matthew chapter seven, we're gonna pick this up in verse 24. And Jesus said this. This is at the end of his wonderful um, teaching, his compilation of teaching that we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. And he's getting ready to wrap up this teaching. And here's what he says. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. Let's pause just for a second. Everyone who hears these words of mine. This right here, this is the come to church part. This is the I raised my hand in service and I said yes to Jesus part. This is the um, I joined a small group part. This is the I come to church, I bring a Bible, I take some notes, I might check in on whatever social media platform I choose. I've checked in at church today. That's this part. Whoever 
hears these words of mine. And then he goes on, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The Greek language, the original language that the New Testament was written in, takes this idea of putting something into practice. And the way that it's structured, it signifies following with the same mind and purpose, with continuing action. In other words, again, this isn't something that we just do one time, because we know that trusting in Jesus is not just a one-time experience, but it is a way of life, and that's exactly what Jesus is telling us here. If you listen to what I'm saying, and then you put it into practice, and you put it into practice, and you continue to put it into practice, you'll realize something you'll realize that you are all of a sudden becoming like a wise person who built their house on a rock. Now, we like the first part of this verse. We like the, I'm hearing the words. I gotta tell you, as a parent, having raised five kids, I can tell you that my kids were experts in hearing my words. It didn't matter what it was. I could, I could call them and ask them to do something. I'd say, hey, listen, I need you to clean your room. I need you to get these chores done. I need you to get this bathroom picked up. We, we gotta get some stuff done around here. And they would look at me with making eye contact and they'd say, okay, dad, okay. And then a while goes by and the work's not getting done. And I'm thinking to myself, what happened? So we circle back around and I say, guys, what happened here? Where's the disconnect? Well, well, Dad, we, we, we heard what you said. And I said, yeah, you, you heard what I said, but you didn't put anything into practice. They just became experts in that, of not putting things into practice that they had heard. And that's what Jesus wants for us. He says, look, I want you to come. I want you to say yes to me, but I want you to start following. I want you to take the things that I say and I want you to put them into practice in your life. Well, Jesus goes on in verse 25. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So here comes the storms, the storms of life, the uncertainty, the instability that is life, and this house that was built on the rock was able to stand firm. Now, Jesus contrasts this with a different kind of lifestyle. In verse 26, he says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, they don't continue in the ways that I say to them. They do not put them into practice. He says, they're like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. And watch this, it fell with a great crash. Life has ups, life has downs. And these things happen. Storms will rage against us. Rains will fall, streams will rise, the winds will start to blow. And Jesus making this great point, he says, he's basically saying to his his audience that's been listening to him unpack all of these incredible teachings, he's basically saying to them, look, I'm so glad that you came. I'm so glad that you're hearing what I'm saying. Thank you so much for taking notes. But Jesus says, look, if you don't hear it and do it, If you just hear it and you don't do anything with it, if you don't put this into practice, you're like a foolish person who built their house with no foundation and then all of a sudden they fall with a great crash. Now listen to me, family. This is not what I want for you. This is not what we at Pure Heart want for you. And the reason that we gather together either physically or online, where we're able to join with you online. The reason that we gather together and we we listen, the reason we come together is, yes, we come together to worship and to hear the word, but also because so many of you, so many of you that are watching, you can relate to this because you've had a great crash in your life. And the reason that you're here is because you don't want another crash to happen in your life. Some of you have 
crashed a marriage. Some of you crashed another marriage. Some of you crashed financially and you're still trying to dig your way out. Some of you have crashed morally and relationally. You've crashed in relation with your kids. Maybe you've crashed in relation to your physical body because you've not taken the proper care of your physical body. And many of us, so many of us have discovered that what Jesus said here in this passage in Matthew 7, we've discovered that it's true, that if we listen and we not only hear, but then we apply, we start to practice the words of Jesus. We realize that following Jesus is not just a one-time event, but it becomes a lifestyle. We can avoid the further crashes of life, and that is exactly what I want for you. I don't want to see you crash, but it's going to take some intentional effort on our part to follow the one in whom we put our trust. We're saying, I'm gonna get out of control. I'm gonna put Jesus in control. And I'm gonna trust that he is gonna drive my life in the best possible way. It's interesting that I've been driving now since I was 16 years old. I've been driving for 36 years, which is crazy to think about. But it's interesting that my 14-year-old daughter, God love her. She knows how to navigate the streets of Phoenix better than I do. Inevitably, we will get in the car and I will head in a direction like we're going to school like we've done a thousand times or we're going to her dance studio where she dances and been there hundreds of times and maybe we're going to visit relatives and we'll get in the car together and inevitably I'll start driving and she'll look at me and say, Dad, why are you going this way? Dad, why don't you go the other way? The other way is faster. The other way is better. And so I, I, I'm always taken back by this. And of course, the, something rises up inside of me that says, honey, I've been driving these streets much longer than you've been alive. But it cracks me up because she's trying to navigate something that she doesn't really have as much experience in. And I'll tell you, I would rather trust my life, the direction of my life, with somebody who sees the end from the beginning, with somebody who knows me better than I know myself, that knows my weaknesses, that knows my tendencies, that, that, that knows the way I think, I would rather have Jesus leading and navigating my life than to try to tell him, oh, hey, there's a better way to do. No, no, no. He knows what that way is. And it's simply trusting in him, not as a one-time experience, but as a lifestyle, hearing and doing, hearing and doing. Our lives are never more in danger than when we try to take control. So Jesus said, if you'll build your life on the foundation that I teach, the foundation of living my ways with me in control, you out of control, When all of these storms crash in, you won't crash. You'll be able to stand. Why? Because hearing and doing make all the difference. And trusting in Jesus is not just a one-time experience, but it is a way of life. Let me say this to you. I am so thrilled that you're coming and listening or watching and listening, but at Pure Heart, we're not 100% content until you are hearing and doing, because we know that both of those make a difference in your life. They start to bridge the gaps in our lives between that initial step of saying yes to Jesus and living out the vibrant life that looks like Jesus. It's hearing and it's doing. Now, years later, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, after he had ascended to heaven and the church has launched, one of his apostles, who was actually his half-brother, James, picked up on this same idea of Jesus' teaching from Matthew chapter 7, and he builds upon that just a little bit. In James 1 and 22, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Interesting, isn't it? Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. I mean, this was 2,000 years ago. And yet, James points to a dynamic that's true today. 
that there is no worse deception than self-deception. Now, now how does he know this? Because he knew, James knew, that there is something inside of us that thinks that just by coming to church, just by watching online, just by hearing and listening, hearing and listening, and that alone, that we're making progress. But just hearing and listening, we think it's going to give us clarity, security, and the certainty in life that we crave. But what we are finding out again is that trusting in Jesus is not a one-time experience. It is a way of life. You found your way into this online experience. You, it, you pulled into a church parking lot. You found your way to a seat, sang some of the songs. Maybe you were moved inside of you. You're thinking, I must be making some progress. James says, that's just a first step in your journey. And if that's all you're doing, he said, quite frankly, you're deceiving yourself. Now, he goes on. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Just like Jesus told us, just like my older brother, Jesus, told you when he was still on the earth, James is saying, look, do what it says. Practice the way of Jesus. If my life isn't changing because of these words, then have I really learned something? Have I really made progress in my journey? Have I really put some things in place in my life that are going to help me avoid the great crashes of life? And then James gives us this incredible word picture of what he's talking about. He says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's a great illustration. I mean, this was this was relevant in the first century. It is extremely relevant now in the 21st century. You see, back then when James was writing this, very few people had a clear reflection of themselves. I mean, imagine the possibility of going through your entire life not really knowing what you looked like. In ancient times, they would have to peer into a still, clear pool of water or look at pieces of shiny bronze. I mean, today, our homes, our lives, they are full of mirrors and pictures. I mean, we can even use our phones as a mirror if we want to, just flip that camera around. We, we have no problem with that. What James is saying is that to come and listen and be challenged and be aware that we need to make change to avoid the great crashes of life, to be aware that we need to date differently, that we need to invest more into our families, into our kids, our marriage. We need to confess something. We need to get rid of this bad habit or addiction, to be aware that we need to change things and then not changing. James says, that's exactly like you getting up in the morning, flipping on the bathroom light, looking in the mirror and saying, Oh, man, I got to do some work here. And then getting dressed and going to school or going to work and doing nothing about what you see. Now, none of us do that. How do I know? Because we will stand there at that mirror and we will work until it gets better. We will fix it. We will do something about what we see. And this idea of ignoring what you see, that, that kind of that went out the window in middle school. I mean, remember when you're in middle school and, and you were going to go spend the night at a friend's house and you called your parents and you said, hey, I've, I've been over here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the night at Johnny's house or I'm going to spend the night at Mary's house or whatever. And, and then the parents would say, well, you know, do you want me to, you want me to bring you some stuff? No, I'm good. Now, as an adult, um, if I'm spending the night at a friend's house, which I, I guess in really thinking about it, that would, that would be kind of weird as an adult, but I mean, if I'm, if I'm spending the night somewhere, I'm, I'm packing a bag. I'm putting in a change of clothes. I'm, I'm throwing in my toothbrush, my mouthwash, my deodorant. I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting ready, and, and, and I've actually lived this out. I've had my kids. When I'm going to spend the night at a friend's house, and we talk and say, do you want me to bring you some stuff? No, no, we're, we're good. I'm thinking, what are you going to do to, for clothes? I'll oh, just wear what I have on tomorrow. Not going to change. What are you going to sleep in? Oh, I guess what, what I'm wearing. 
See, we outgrow that. We outgrow that stage. And now as adults, we don't leave the mirror until we do something about what we see. James says to sit under God's teaching, to listen to his word, that's meant to change the trajectory of our life and still try to control, to become aware that change needs to take place in our heart, that change needs to take place in a relationship or a habit or an addiction, something I need to confess, someone I need to apologize to, someone I need to forgive, there's money I need to quit spending the way that I am, a relationship I need to get out of. James says to listen to God's word and become aware and not do anything about it is like looking in a mirror and saying, you know what, I need to deal with that. And then you leave and you don't do anything. We would never look in the mirror and be aware of just how bad things are and then go on to school or work and act like that there's nothing there. And here's what's strange. The greatest regrets that I have in my life when the rain's came down and the, the storms came up, the floods rose and the wind started beating against the house of my life and the crashes that I've had, my greatest regrets have nothing to do with whether or not I got up and made myself look good on the outside. My greatest regrets are things that I failed to deal with on the inside because I refused to let Jesus lead, and control my life. I thought I was in control. I thought I had everything together, but I was really out of control because I was not out of control. Because trusting in Jesus is not a one-time experience. It's a way of life. James goes on, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it. James says there's freedom in doing this. There's freedom that comes when you give up control and you allow Jesus to fully lead your life. He says if you look into the perfect law that gives freedom, it's an invitation to us to do that. He continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So let me ask you as we move toward the end of this message, are you heading for a crash right now? You know your life. You know where you're at. Are you in a spot where you're headed for a crash? Or maybe you've already crashed. You gotta keep hearing and you gotta keep doing. You gotta keep encountering God but then you gotta keep putting those things into practice in your life. It is absolutely liberating. It brings incredible freedom and it will lead to a blessed life. James says there at the very end, they will be blessed in what they do. And this idea of being blessed, we're not talking about just some external reward. We're talking about an inner sense of peace and calm that comes from doing life his way and letting him have control. You see, trusting Jesus is not a one-time experience. It's a way of life. I have this inner sense of peace that comes from having an inner life and an inner character that is formed and shaped by Jesus. When he's in control, he brings incredible clarity. When he's in control, he brings incredible security. And he brings a non-anxious sense of certainty to my life where I may not be certain about what is going on around me, but I am certain that because he is in charge, he's in control, he's driving my life, that I can avoid the great crashes of life. Because I am out of control, and he is in control, my life can be built on a sure foundation that can withstand these great ups and downs of life as we move from an initial decision of trusting Jesus to a lifestyle of following him. 
I would love the opportunity to pray for you as we bring this message to a close. And there's some of you that, that may be watching and you're at a point now where your life has just crashed. Or maybe you're headed towards a crash. And maybe you've never at any point in your life said yes to Jesus. Can I encourage you today that that is the greatest decision that you will ever make in your life? And as we're speaking right now, depending on how you're watching this message this weekend, there's a hand that's coming up on the screen. And if you click on that hand, you click on that button, or if, you, if there's no icon there, you have an opportunity to type a response into a chat bar, and then somebody will be connecting with you to tell you about some next steps once you say yes to Jesus and pray this prayer in your heart. Maybe those of you that have said yes to Jesus already, you need to recommit your life to him. It's a rededication of your life where you're saying, you know, Jesus, I'm here and I've said yes to you, but now I'm gonna take this to the next level and I'm gonna really lean into not only what you say, but I'm gonna put some things into practice in my life that's gonna help me along life's journey that can be hazardous and treacherous that will help me avoid the great crashes. So would you, wherever you're at, just pray this in your heart. Say, dear Jesus, I thank you that you gave your life for me. I thank you that you are certain in a world of uncertainty. And on this day, I choose right now to put my faith, my hope, and my confidence in you. I choose to put my trust in you, to begin to follow you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, that you would come into my life, be the leader of my life, be the Lord of my life. And I ask these things in your name. Amen. And Father, right now, I also pray for all those that are watching, that their life may be either crashing or have crashed or they're headed towards a crash. Would you give us the grace to evaluate whether we are truly hearing and doing or if we're just listening? Help us to realize that trusting in Jesus is not just a one-time experience, but it's a way of life. Would you give us all that grace? I pray for those today. Father, that you would bring no condemnation, but God, that you would come alongside as only you can and that you would let them know and be assured that you're gonna give them the grace to navigate this season. And by the power and strength of your Holy Spirit, you're going to allow them to continue to walk with you and follow you at a new level of freedom. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Recently, for our Because It Worth It moments, we've been highlighting the four LifeBridge Resource Center locations across the Phoenix metro area. And this week, we wanted to highlight on what is happening with LifeBridge at Metro Center. Through our partnership with U-Haul, who owns a former Macy's building there, we were given the use of an entire first floor of this structure with 55,000 square feet of space. We set up a primary hub and distribution center for the west side of Metro Phoenix. We receive all types of goods from all over the country from multiple partnerships we have. Things like retail returns from online department stores, toys, donated food, mattresses, home and office furniture. Then. Here's the best part. We get to distribute those goods back out into partnering organizations to meet the needs of our community, such as Better Together Churches, Public Schools, Department of Child Safety, local Hispanic and African American churches. In all, we distribute these supplies into a network that we started with 32 organizations and churches that we get to pour into. We've also targeted the huge food scarcity needs in this Metro Center neighborhood by doing drop-in, drive-through food distribution events at this location. Since March, we have met the immediate needs of thousands of individuals. This is just another example of the great things God is letting us be a part of. Heavenly Father, thank you for what Pure Heart is able to do in this time of crisis, Lord. Thank you for the opportunities, the partnerships, the ways you continue to just pour things in, God, and let us be faithful to continue to pour out, God. Bless each of those that are watching and listening as they give their tithes and offerings, Lord. Those who are struggling, Lord, help them financially. We ask for your blessing in all this in the name of Jesus. Thank you, family, for your continued support of Pure Heart and the ministries that we get to partner with in this time of challenge. As you put your tithes and offerings in the mail, as you're giving online, texting to give, or doing it in the Pure Heart app, know that these are the types of things that your faithfulness is continuing to go to support. 
be encouraged. Have an amazing week. Keep your focus on Him as we continue to love like Christ for the sake of others in new and exciting ways. We'll see you next week.